Welcome back to the Capes and Tights podcast. I'm your host, Justin Soderberg. We're here at capesandtights.com. This episode, episode number 110, features Dennis Hopeless, comic book writer of Secret Wars House of M, All New X Men, Avengers Arena, Avengers Undercover, Spider Woman, Doctor Strange, Star Wars Vader, Dark Visions, Revenge of the Cosmic Ghost Rider, Invader Zim, WWE, some DC comics, Exo Man of War. His new book that just came out on Vault, Hard Eyes, which drops in trade July 19th, as well as The Carmen Line, an original graphic novel over at Mad Cave. This guy's a busy guy. So we chatted mostly on this episode, some of his early work in getting into Marvel and DC uh, and so on, as well as Heart Eyes over at Vault Comics and The Carmen Line at Mad Cave on episode 110. So make sure you tune into this episode with Dennis Hopeless, comic book writer. Enjoy, everyone. Welcome to the podcast, Dennis. How are you? Yeah, doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, where are you? East Coast, West Coast? Where are you uh, situated? Right in the middle, Kansas City, right the, Missouri. Kansas City. There you go. Some good comic book people in Kansas City. <clears throat> I mean, there's comic book people. I don't know how good we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, you've been in the comic book industry for a little while now, but like to get started here, just so people don't know who uh, you know who you are. How did you get into comic books in the first place? Were you a comic book reader as a kid? And then that just grew into, you know, working in the industry. How did that happen? What's your origin story? Yeah, so I was I was a big fan of comics, like middle school age, right around the time uh, that Image was taking off, like the Image creators were blowing up at Marvel and then they left to go do Image when I was mm -hmm. like the perfect comic book age. Um, and then I kind of fell off a little bit. The local comic shop closed around the time I got into high school. Um, so I fell off for a few years. And then I went to um, Kansas State University and for some reason decided to get a film degree from K-State, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so like my sophomore year of college, they had us do a storyboarding project. And I, I had seen the comic book shop uh, down in a little bar district. And like, I, you know, I remember loving the comic shop. I'll go in there. Comics are kind of like storyboards. So uh, went in and at the time, like Kevin Smith was doing Green Arrow. Preacher was finishing up or maybe it just finished. So all the trades were out. And I'm like, oh, shit, this stuff has gotten really good. Um, so I started reading comics voraciously in college. Uh, but my plan <clears throat> was always to go uh, write movies. I want to be a screenwriter. Uh, so when I got out of college, moved back to Kansas City um, and realized there wasn't a lot of screenwriting opportunities in the middle of the country. I was going to have to move to L.A. Uh, to do that. So I got a job at a comic shop in my hometown that had just opened up and met an artist uh, Kevin Mellon, who had just gotten home from a Kubert school in New Jersey. And I was like, well, I can make my movies on paper and then we want to go anywhere. I can have Kansas City rent, uh, but uh, still still tell my stories. So Kevin and I developed some stuff. Um, in 2007, we got our first book published, Gearhead, from Arcana Comics. Um, made absolutely no money on that, but <laughs> in promoting that, started going around um, to different comic conventions and, you know, meeting different creators and stuff. And so I spent the next five or six years developing a bunch of projects with, uh, you know, friends that I had met at comic conventions and all of them died. Like for whatever reason, every project would die in the vine. Like Phil Hester and I co-wrote a uh, tornado thriller about a storm chasing person uh, that got half like the artist drew half of the book. It was like a hundred page graphic novel. He drew 55 pages and then Dark Horse scooped him up to do Hellboy and he never stopped doing Hellboy work. Like he's still <laughs> working there. Um, so that died. I had a um, a project with Scotty Young uh, that we were co-writing. He was drawing way back in the day. And then he got, his wife got pregnant with their first kid. And he's like, I'm gonna take a break uh, for like, you know, paternity uh, <laughs> break. And he got busy with other stuff and never came back to it. Uh, and then I just had all of these things that were like, it was art, it was partially done, but nothing was ever going to happen with it. Um, and around the time my book with Kevin, my second book with Kevin, uh, Love Struck, came out through Image, was about to come out. I was just like fed up with all these things dying. And I had always heard you couldn't submit to Marvel and DC unless it was published work. I didn't really want to just send my very first book because yeah. you know, that was me getting my feet wet. I was a lot better now. So I took all of the, the um, published pages 
or not published, all of the drawn pages of all of those dead projects, uh, put them together, made up publishers, like the release dates in the future and created logos for them to make it look like they were coming out. And then I made like a Kinko's spiral bound package and sent all my favorite Marvel and DC editors with a hope and a prayer, um, lying through my teeth. <laughs> and then like 10 months later, Alejandro Arbona from Marvel, uh, said, Hey, I've had your packet on my desk for like a year and I was cleaning my desk up and I flipped through it. There's a bunch of amazing stuff in here. Would you be interested in pitching something? And around that same time, I'm friends with Jason Aaron yeah. and he was doing a CBR column. Uh, and he interviewed me about like how hard it is to like, to be grinding it out and not break yeah. in. And Axel Alonso had read that around the same time that Alejandro read my packet. It was getting passed around. So by the time I had my phone call about maybe pitching something someday uh, with Alejandro, he just gave me Legion of Monsters. Kieran Gillen was supposed to write Legion of Monsters and had and couldn't do it. And so he's like, would you like to do this? So I started doing a, that. It's a four issue miniseries, I think, Legion of Monsters. While I was working on that, somebody quit X-Men season one and Jamie McKelvey was already attached to draw it. And I don't I never got the full story of who that was, but somebody couldn't make that work. And so Alejandro's like, do you want to write this X-Men book? It's about the early days of the X-Men. And I completely misunderstood the assignment. Like I, I kept pitching like changes and retcons and all this stuff. And he was like, no, no, no. This is supposed to be the exact old stories, but with cell yeah. phones. Like we're just going to age it up. But <laughs> I couldn't wrap my head around that. So what I ended up doing was like, a story between the raindrops of the old stories that told like a character drama of the kids around all of the fights from the original Stan and Jack stuff. Um, those books came out and were really, really well received mm -hmm. and sold really well. Like I'm a, technically a New York Times bestselling author because back when they had graphic novels, yeah. X-Men season one was on there. So, um, so yeah, like I think that kind of got my foot all the way in the door at Marvel and they just kept me fed for like a decade yes. uh, <laughs> and then you haven't yeah, gone away yeah <laughs> no 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 yeah i published like two indie books and a bunch of non-starters and then i got in at marvel and just was off to the races well first of all i think those two uh the, the two you mentioned the twister horror thing i i think that needs to be published I think you, you need to go back and work on that because i will read that uh and the second thing is uh scotty's been on the podcast too scotty's a great dude and I am a huge fan of his artwork. So I would love to see that, uh, a, a, a team up of you two again. So those two things shouldn't die. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Scotty and I have talked about it. We love the project. The problem is, like, Scotty's career took off during that yeah. same time period. And he doesn't really draw stuff that other people mm -hmm. write as much anymore. Um, you know, he's worked with Neil Gaiman and stuff. So Scotty and I are still really good friends, and we've talked about it. But that project will probably appear someday. I doubt. Scotty may do covers. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure we can afford Scotty Young on the interiors anymore, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it, it's, it's a passion project for both of us, and it's, it's sad that that would ever happen. Wait, Scotty still does interior still? What are you talking about? I don't think <laughs> <laughs> occasionally on his own stuff. Either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like there, here and there. Uh, no, that's pretty funny. Those two things. I'm a huge. Uh, I watched a Storm Chasers TV show when it was on TV. Twister is one of my favorite movies. So like anything to do with Storm Chasers, Chasers and and twisters and horror and anything like that i'm down for so that book would be amazing and then again obviously big fan of scotty young's i actually have multiple scotty young tattoos uh <laughs> his artwork's amazing so uh, i know that's pretty funny but that's an awesome story I, you know a big marvel head too i, I love marvel uh, i i think that uh you know for years that's been my thing i'm not a huge dc fan but a big marvel fan for a long time so that's cool and i, I wanted to get you on here to talk about some of your independent stuff um but what's it been like working at, uh, you know like you know being a fan then getting to the point where you actually can can write characters like x-men and, and spider-woman and things like that it was really fun it was really stressful at first um those first two projects i was doing when i still had my old day job and it was extremely stressful to realize people were going to look at my stuff because i'd only done two indie books that didn't sell at all uh, and nobody saw them so like on independent especially small your first projects when you don't haven't built a name up yet you don't even really get reviews like very mm -hmm. few people look at it so you don't get it and then you come into marvel and like those season one books they sold really well and i mean they made my career but people were angry that they were changing that they were like retconning the dates and changing stuff up and so there was a lot of um just you know fan reaction that i wasn't mm -hmm. used to and then my very first ongoing was uh, avengers arena and boy did the internet hate that idea <laughs> uh, the people that actually read it we turned around we got good reviews and stuff and it sold well 
but yeah, I, I started going to therapy because of Avengers Arena because it having the weight of like just that fan reaction and the, the vitriol when they don't like something you're doing to their favorite characters was a lot to deal with. But I think the trial by fire of that taught me, okay, I can't please everyone. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to hate every single thing that I've done. And the way the social media works as that started to become a bigger part of it, people are in a echo chamber of other people that agree with them in, in fandom. So like, my Spider Woman run, for instance, we only got good reviews. Like that yes. is widely considered by fans of the book and most Spider Woman fans to be like a seminal run of Spider Woman. It's one of my proudest things I've done. But if you ask people to hate it, everyone hated it from the beginning. It's a ridiculous debacle <laughs> that is like a, a a mark on in comics history. And you just have to ignore that stuff. Like that yeah. book wasn't for those people. There's other Spider Woman work, you know, including Carla's stuff that came after that they like better. And that's great. But you just can't take it. You can't take it personally. So that was the part that was the hardest to navigate for me, other than deadlines. I, yes. My ADHD makes deadlines very difficult. <laughs> but other than just the, you know, the grind of it, it was getting used to that fan reaction and not taking it personally. Understanding these people don't actually know me. There was yes. that hashtag, fuck Dennis Hopeless. I wanted to make t-shirts during Avengers Arena. Uh, and like those people, that's... <laughs> They are cursing the name on the kind of front of a comic book, not me. They don't know me personally. So once exactly. I got once I got used to that, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty fun to just get to play in the toy box. Well, I laugh at that too because like I don't think anybody's gonna come up to you at a convention and be like "fuck that is hopeless" like to your face. Yeah. Like it's like they're behind the internet of, of the wall of the internet. People will say stuff like that, but I don't. It's one of those things. I mean, someone might if they have the balls to do it, but like it, most people, just because they have the hide can hide behind their computer monitor. <laughs> Uh, and say that stuff to you but like i mentioned that with uh we did a star wars week here on the podcast and we had a couple people on we talked about how like writing star wars comic books or books and things like that touching something that's such a like a uh you know a, a, it's people are so touchy on their star wars stuff yeah. that how do you deal with the people's backlash or writing a certain character a certain way and so on and so forth obviously you've done it with dark uh, darth vader a little bit there too with, with dark visions but like you have to just like go, you know what? You're a, also the other part about it is you're a fan too. So the way you write your books, it's not like you're writing it from a, a point of view of the, of the X-Men of like, I hate the X-Men. So I'm going to write X-Men and ruin the franchise. Like you're writing it as a fan too. So you want the best possible outcome for the X-Men. And if someone doesn't like her Spider-Woman, for example, right. uh, if people don't like it, it's like, it's not like you're trying to ruin their favorite thing. You're writing yeah. it from a point of a fan as well. <laughs> Exactly. One, especially with the X-Men, people yeah. grew up on specific eras and the X-Men's changed a lot and been a lot of different things. So if you are like scratching the itch of a certain era, those fans think you're amazing. Mm -hmm. But the people who liked before or after that are like, what is this trash again? Like, I thought we were yes. over this. Um, and, you know, you're not even really, it's not like you're trying to retread that stuff. It's just what you were inspired by or, you know, what you went and reread in the research stage. Like, oh, I could play with that. And yeah, if you get near the the childhood love of it, it there's a lot of passion both positive and negative and i think it's the same for star wars fans like it, yes. if you're doing the fan service that they like great if you're doing something else why are you ruining my childhood yes. and i mean yeah you just kind of have to ignore it and do your best and try to put out good work yeah i mean a lot of it comes from the idea they have a they have an idea in their head of what they want their star wars to look like and you're not you know dennis hopeless is not doing that and because right. you're not doing that you're doing it wrong and it's like that whole statement that like you're allowed to have your own opinion, but your opinion can be wrong. And it's like, right. well, it's not true. It's an opinion. But like you're doing a story and this is the stories. We have to have new stories for these things that are like, I mean, Spider-Woman, you know, X-Men have been around for years. You have to yeah. have a new story. You can't just continue churning out the same thing over and over again uh, or it doesn't go anywhere. So well, but, people wouldn't like that if you did it. They yes. think they want exactly that. But, you know, look at television shows that yes. went on too long. Like friends didn't change a lot. You just got sick of the same storylines over mm. and over. And so by the end of it, it's stale, right? Like, uh, yeah, at some point you have to yeah. risk annoying people with new to avoid retreading. When well, you see that with The Walking Dead, The Walking Dead was like, people were like, well, they changed this. They added characters. Da, da, da. I'm like, yeah, well, you also, I also don't want to read Walking Dead 1 through 10 and then watch the TV show and have it just be a live action right. version of it well, line by line with what Robert Kirkman wrote. Like, I want to see someone else's slight interpretation with the same themes and the same you know trajectory and where it's going you couldn't go halfway through walking dead and all of a sudden they're in space that's right. just crazy but like the way they did it wasn't exactly the way the comic book was but it was 
different. And it was someone's other, other writing teams got together and said, we can tweak it a little bit to make it our own thing, which is great. So I think that's what the comic books nowadays too, with like, if someone were to take Spider-Woman now and change some things that you did in Spider-Woman, it's just a new take on the character. It's a new, it's the, it's progressing the character future further. I mean, so. For sure. Uh, and what we, with Spider-Woman in particular, what we did, you know, we made a character drama about her going through the, the change of becoming a parent. And then, you know, we created a relationship with Porcupine. We played that whole thing out. And then we had an ending. Like we got to do a, a finale where they happily ever after. Well, this is a perpetual second act medium. Like mm -hmm. that was never going to be the end of that story. And of course, the next person who took over wasn't going to tell more of what we did because we, we finished that. So you just kind of have to, you know, you don't own these characters. You borrow them for a minute and do the coolest stuff you can and then give them back for other people to play with. And you, you see now you've worked at two the, the big two. I mean, obviously you've had done work at Marvel and done work at DC. Um, are they very similar to work for? Like, is this just like you're, you're, you're using with intellectual property, you're working within their constraints and things like that. Is there much difference between writing between the two big two? Uh, so my experience is that DC have been on stuff with, like I'm, I'm developing a project there now that's, it's a it's a long term like let's figure this out it's not going to come out for a year yeah um and there's a lot more development things at marvel are a lot more seat of your pants because they're like let's get it done like mm -hmm. you get a you get approval on your plot outline they want a script in two days so the artist can get started um whereas at dc that a couple of things the two the um blue beetle thing i did and thing i'm working on now were long development mm -hmm. and then i did a suicide squad run with robbie thompson that led into war for Earth three and that was a scheduling nightmare because the editor left and okay. so we lost six weeks of lead time. And now all of a sudden I got to feed multiple artists on an event book that hasn't even been plot approved yet. Uh, so that from a, from a scheduling standpoint was an unmitigated nightmare. And this like the most terrifying uh, work for hire I've ever done. Um, but so some of it's the situation, some of it's yeah, the yeah. editors you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I've just done a lot more Marvel work. So like looking at my Marvel career on the whole, I'm looking at averages at DC. I've got like three experiences basically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, it, they're, they're both pretty open to you playing with the, with the toys within reason, you know, they don't want you to mess up Superman or whatever. Uh, but as long as you're being faithful to the heart of the character, I think. Mm -hmm. And as long as you've got an editor that's um, on board with what you want to do and like a good, a good member of the team. Yeah. It's, it's pretty similar. That's awesome. So, but now you're doing, you, you obviously you mentioned before you've done some independent work, but like you had two projects that have come out uh, within the past, you know, year uh, yeah. with, with hard eyes over at vault. Is that correct? Vault yeah. comics. Yep. And then obviously we, we I mentioned off the top, uh, Carmen line uh, to talk about Carmen line is what's the difference. What do you find the difference? Is it easier to write your own stuff? You know, then you're not dealing with, with that is it easier, but it's different. Obviously what's different it's, in your mind between the two, like writing your own stuff versus theirs. It's harder in the world building because mm -hmm. you have to, like at Marvel and DC, the readers kind of understand the world and it's set, right? You don't have to explain why Doctor Strange uses magic. Doctor Strange just uses magic, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. that stuff's set up. They exist in a world of superheroes. Um, one of the most fun things and one of the more challenging things, most challenging things about doing creator owned is you got to build all that from scratch and you got to make that clear within the 20 pages where you're also setting up the plot mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like, and throwing out that first cliffhanger. So uh, there's a lot more planning ahead of time that goes into it. Um, I, I talk about this a lot with collaborator, collaborators. Pitches at Marvel and DC are like, like a cool idea to an editor. Like, yeah, you know, like half a page. Like, what if we did this? But you let you leave a lot of like leeway in case the editor likes something or doesn't, and you can kind of develop it together. At a, a creator own pitch, it's got to be like, this is the beginning, middle, end of the story. This is what we're saying. These are the themes. Like, this is what we're gonna do. Um, the document's not that much longer, but it's a lot more like, I understand this, trust me, give me money to make it, right? Um, so there's a lot more planning um, that goes into it. I, Because of how my career worked and because I'm not super fast, I didn't do that much creator own work in the middle of the like heaviest Marvel work. Um, so I took a lot of years where I was just doing work for hire. I was, you know, I was either doing superhero work at Marvel, Star Wars, uh, I did uh, WWE comic for three yeah. years. But it was all licensed properties, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I started working on Sea of Stars at Image with Jason Aaron, it had been a decade since I'd done Creator Own, really. 
because like the answer i did the answer with mike norton and dark horse but we wrote that before my marvel career started it just took a while for him to be able mm-hmm. to draw it um when i got back to it, it was really fun like oh i don't ha- i don't need permission like our editor just copy edits and help, helps us keep the train running on time yeah. like we can do whatever we want i can kill everyone and start over it, it was a lot of fun so um that part is really exciting and then during uh when the pandemic first started when the pencils down happened i used that time mm-hmm. when i wasn't alone at home with my children for a year to develop some of the ideas i had and develop some of the relationships with artists that i had to make the creator own books i never had time to make and realized during that period like oh this is the next stage of my career like i'm gonna pull back do less work for hire you know make some money outside of comics in order to like really do stuff I'm passionate about and head in that direction. So the last two years have been really, really focused on creator own and slow rolling work for hire because I want that. I want to get that passion back. I mean, it's only so many times you can write the same characters, punch each other in the face before you feel like you're on a treadmill. So it's been a really great like break. And uh, yeah, it's fun to just tell whatever kind of story and whatever genre it doesn't have to be a robot in it. It doesn't have to be a big yep. fight in the third act. Um, that's been it's been refreshing as a, as a creator. That's, that's awesome. I mean, the, the the hard eyes and Carmen line are two different stories in the sense too, which is awesome. To give the ability to expand without you know capes and tights being the name of this podcast, but expand outside of capes and tights and do some more things. Obviously, there's more monsters things in. And monstrous things in hard eyes, whereas the Carmen lines have been space. Uh, it's dealing with space station stuff. It's like you know, so there's some different stuff you can do as well, which is kind of cool. Uh, um, did did hard eyes come from your brain to paper and stuff like that, and then you brought on Victor uh, Ibanez, or was that like a team uh, team up thing from the beginning? Yeah, it was a team up thing from the beginning. Victor and I worked on Jean Gray together at yeah. Marvel, okay. and his art is stunning. Uh, yes. But he has a hard time with. Um, monthly deadlines so we had a lot of villains on that book but every time Victor would uh, he would draw a book on an issue he would just knock it out of the park so we we had talked about working together but I never really had time for it and then uh, when COVID hit he had a just a drawing from his sketchbook that he posted on Facebook that was you know a girl and her like pet squid monster thing and he, I was like what is that and he's like I don't know it's a drawing you want to you do something with it and so we developed Hard Eyes based on his drawings of like Lovecraftian monsters and yeah. this girl with glasses. Um, and so it, it it comes from his like visual inspiration and then everything I was feeling at the start of the pandemic, you know, like is, is the world over? Do we just have to live this way forever? Is my career ever coming back? Like, are my children ever going to be out of the house again? So I can think, uh, all, you know, I had all of these emotions. And so we turned that into a, um, you know, like a Lovecraftian apocalypse love story. Uh, with Victor's visuals being the, like yeah. the kind of the kind of uh, roadmap for it, it, it I'm, a, I'm a my wife and I are both. Like, I want her to read this too because I, we're both po- post apocalyptic suckers. Like we love anything that's in that kind of genre, uh, on, on that sense. And the, our book is absolutely stunning. You mentioned that already, but like it is, it's a beautiful book to, to look at too. It's funny, uh, you know. I don't obviously don't want to give away the the trade comes out um, soon, right? Uh, July nineteenth. Yeah, I believe the trade comes out from Vault Comics. Uh, you know, you just wrapped up the this mini series in March, I believe. Uh, was that correct? Yeah, uh, end yeah. of March, the final issue came out. But um, so I don't want to ruin it for people who want to who want to actually pick it up and read it because you should pick up and read it. Uh, but like, it's funny because at the beginning it was like, okay, post apocalyptic. It seemed like it was gonna be some sort of love story too, which was like falling in love is hard enough, I think, in real life, let alone falling in love in a in in a post apocalyptic world like i feel like if it was me as a, if it was single person in the post apocalyptic world and i saw a female i would just be like oh a female oh yeah. nice this is amazing so like falling in love in that sense and it takes twists and turns throughout the entire series that it's not exactly what i expected it to be uh you know part way through the first issue which is another thing i love which is one of those things that you don't know what to expect uh moving forward in the book it, it continues on to be just a, it's, it's an unbelievable book I, I will say people should read this book at vault comics how did it end up at vault is that just pitching and timing we, yeah we wanted to do it um a, a lot of publishers were getting a lot of pitches around the same mm-hmm. time um and so i kind of just pitched it to everybody and vault was really quick to come back um adrian at vault yes the editor-in-chief is a huge fan of my Spider Woman run, so I didn't know that, but I think that helped. It worked in our favor, so he was like all about it. And Victor's yeah. art's obviously gorgeous. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, they were on board. And we, I think the subversive nature of it, where it looks like it's one thing, it, that, that book was really hard to to promote with issue one because issue one looks like it's Romeo and Juliet in a Lovecraftian world. And then we kill Romeo at the first page of the second <laughs> issue uh, and it becomes a different thing. Yeah. But, you know, we're really doing the like, we're turning the manic pixie dream girl thing on its head uh, throughout that story. And I think that resonated really well with the people of all. They really liked that idea. Um, you know, what it looks like it's gonna be is totally not. Um, and it's something else entirely. But at the end of the day, it still is a love story um, mm -hmm. that yes. takes place. It's just a different kind of love story. And it, it's not the one you you think it's initially gonna be. But I was really impressed with Vault. You know, it's a, it's a relatively new company that had only done a couple of things I'd even heard of. And they have been amazing to work with um, from, from the very beginning, like, a really great editorial relationship with Adrian um, and with Dershing. And then the, and they have an actual marketing department that calls mm -hmm. you and like has plans and talks about social media and does different things. They're, they're creative yeah, with that. And then just watching them grow since I, since we started talking with them through, you know, the, the, yeah. the production of the book, they're just growing and doing all sorts of new, exciting, crazy stuff all the time. So yeah, I've been really impressed, but at the time it was just that uh, these guys are, enthusiastic about this story let's do it with them yeah and uh, your the series five issues four issues six issues those mini series to me are are where the world seems to be going a little bit in comic books like there are a few stories that are now kind of open-ended and they're continuing as ongoings um but to me it's the reason i explain to people if it's a five issue series just read all five issues like just, it's not that hard to do five issues is easy to do it's one trade pick that up and the reason why I say do the whole thing is exactly how you wrote this this series, where it's right. like if you just read issue one, you would not get the entire picture of what's going on in this no. thing. There are certain comic books that you go, okay, you can get an idea of where this is going, and maybe you should read the whole thing, but maybe you don't have to, or if you don't feel like it, don't. But like the fact that it twists and turns so much between issue one and two, it's like that's another reason why I always say, I think I'm again back to the Walking Dead, a big Walking Dead fan here is the first season was like eight episodes. I was right. like, you don't just watch episode one. It's eight episodes. Watch the entire eight episodes and then take your opinion on whether or not you should watch season two. Same this, like read one, two, three. And if you get three issues in, you might as well read the whole five issues right. <laughs> and, and read the whole thing. So that's what I'm saying. Like you did that enough to get you hooked after issue one. And so you're like, okay, I want to read issue two. And then after issue, the beginning of issue two, you're like, holy shit, now I need to read this whole thing. And that's why I feel like you need to read more than one issue. <laughs> yeah, when I, the way I write, and it's probably because I did so much Marvel work before right. I really dug into creating your own. I do, and you know, it's serialized storytelling. I do TV shows, not movies. So a lot of people, when they do a, you know, five issue mini, that's a movie broken up into pieces. For me, it's a short run TV series. It's like a British style TV series. So I do a lot of twisting and turning and changing things between issues, um, which makes I think my stuff read better in trade mm -hmm. a lot because you don't know where it's going and it's all there. But um, but yeah, I agree. I the reason. Like the monetary reason why miniseries are the name of the game now is because attrition, you start losing money by issue yeah. five or six. So if you even a 12 issue story, you're going to lose money for a while. See, stars, we really wanted to get, you know, two, uh, two trades out of it. And that meant, you know, going into the red for the, the last few issues that we have to make that back. Um, so, yeah, it's it, it's an interesting thing to figure out how to do my storytelling style, but in a limited space. And uh, the Carmen line was the first time in a long time that I've done a, um, a graphic novel. And it's yeah. it's pretty short. I mean, I think it's like 80 pages. 80 uh, pages or something like that, yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was fun. That was a fun challenge. Like, how do I do essentially a one shot, but with 80 some pages? Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and knock it out. Well, is it, so I guess my question, I had a question lined up for that too, is like, so you did, you did the mini series at Vault, uh, single issue of floppies released monthly kind of thing. And then it, in a trade format. And then the Carmen line goes into this, you know, graphic novel, novella kind of thing where it's only 80 something pages. Uh, what was the decision making behind making this, you know, one book versus doing single issues? It's just Mad Cave, what just... Mad Cave wanted. Yeah. Mad Cave came to me with a couple of different, just like one sentence ideas and a length so like we want to put out some uh graphic novellas um do any either of these ideas interest you and um the carmen line idea kind of reminded me of the space station thriller spaceship thriller from the 90s like uh 
event horizon sort of a thing. Um, and I'm like, oh, I've never done anything like that. That would be fun. Um, but we knew going in that it was like 80 ish pages. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I had that. I spent, I spent like two weeks just watching every R rated space movie that I had missed when my kids were little. <laughs> um, so I think everything since 2014 or whatever that came out, um, and just to soak it in and, and see what people have been doing since the last time I saw one of these. And then, um, and yeah, I was just noodling around trying to figure out who the characters were. What's the, what's the drama? What's the world of this thing? Uh, you know, based on the, they, they gave me the very, very short tagline of a bunch of, a bunch of astronauts from different countries are on an international space station and news comes from home that puts them at odds and then they have to survive each other and try to get home. And the rest of it, we kind of all fleshed out from there. Um, but it was, it was a bit interesting. It was kind of like a cross between full creator own, figure it out from scratch, come up with your idea, and then what I do at Marvel and DC, yeah. where like I had I had a lot of free reign. I got to do all the world building. It was all fresh and brand new. I could change whatever I wanted, but it was a concept somebody threw up. That's awesome. And, and and did you pick out or 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 pick out Peter Kowalski, or was that one something Mad Cave brought to you? Mad Cave brought. Because well, yeah. Peter, I, mean, I, I, he is one of my favorite artists right now. I, I the, this, this stuff that he's done, he did Weird Monsters Live with Kyle Starks, and that mm -hmm. was absolutely stunning as well. And the artwork in here, and this cover itself is just freaking like it drew yeah. me in from the beginning. Um, and then uh, another company, another publisher with an excellent marketing department. Yes, like it's like these small publishers. I think it's funny because I'm not going to call out any names, and people can insinuate or figure out what I'm talking about. But there's been a company recently who just fired their entire marketing department, and yeah. I don't understand. Like my, I work my day job is I'm a creative director who does graphic design and marketing for a brewery, and right. we I'm an in-house person. And, and if you compare myself to a brewery around the same size that has an external person or doesn't have this kind of a department, you can see the yeah. all, uh, the, the differences. And just seeing, I mean, I get, if you see behind me, if you, like there's a, the Carmen line poster, they mail me, I have stickers. Um, I just got a um, John Tiffany, uh, Dan Panosian's new uh, graphic no novel, and they sent me candy cigarettes. <laughs> like awesome. there's like, it's just these things that are like, I can say I got coffee for Don't Spit in the Wind. Um, and so their marketing and stuff like that on it is unbelievable. So this, mag I mean, I'll basically read because of that as someone who, <clears throat> in the comic book industry, I'll be reading anything from Mad Cave, but then obviously attaching Peter's name to it and your name to it. I was like, I'm in, I'm hundred yeah, percent on board. Exactly. Throw it in space. You yeah, got me even yeah, more, uh, you know, horror stories being in space on a space yeah, station with people from all over the world is and, scary enough, I would think. And then you right. add it into like other horror things that are going on in it. I just feel like this horror story becomes even more, uh, you know, fleshed out that way. Um, training to be a space or be an astronaut is a tough thing, right? Obviously you learn this over some research and things like that. We obviously yeah. know that. Um, and then having someone from a marketing department <laughs> say that you also now have to uh, get viewers and social media likes and things like that to, to continue your thing. How did that idea come about? Like, how was that like? Well, I was thinking about, so I was thinking about how we've gone from a reality TV world to a everybody records themselves on TikTok world, right? Mm -hmm. And how those two things are like probably equally false, but we kind of believe the TikTok one more because nobody has makeup on and there's no, you know, the, the, the camera work they've done themselves. Like it, it feels more legit. Yeah. And so I was thinking like, we've just become more and more like show people the best version of you or the most interesting version of you to get, to get attention. Um, but astronauts have been doing this shit for decades. Like yeah. the boring, let me show you how I drink juice in space videos. <laughs> like we've been seeing that stuff forever. And unless you're a little kid and you've never seen it before, like no one cares. Yeah. Like those live streams that they that they do on the space station and stuff, unless you're a big space nerd, it's it's not compelling in the way that the movies that we see about that stuff are like, oh, this crazy stuff's happening and there's love triangles and, and you know, like there's monsters everywhere, whatever. Um, and so I thought, what if the space program desperately needed public support for a really unpopular program for the future of humanity? And they knew they needed to get people invested, but the astronauts are astronauts and boring. How do they, how do they force it? How do they trick them? Um, and we do some twists and turns in that where like, they're trying to be interesting on camera, but it's obvious they're trying. 
So what if we show the actual interesting moments as well and create this duality? Um, yeah, it was, it was it was just me thinking about yeah how like the the real the real world led to uh, trashy reality shows, which led to TikTok, which led to YouTube, or I mean YouTube to TikTok, TikTok and. Yeah. What are the differences between those things and why are they compelling to us? I, I honestly think that if we had a reality TV show based on a space station, it'd be one of the highest viewed programming on in, in the world at the time right now. Like, I would think that would be insanely fun to watch. It would, but you'd need producers <laughs> up there creating yes. drama like they do on reality shows, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, is the reality to the point where, like, let's be honest, most reality shows, they're like... Like even Survivor, there's like doctors and people yeah. standing by that if someone gets bit by a poisonous snake, they can come out there and like make sure this person doesn't die on national television. Um, but like there's like so many things that could go wrong on a space station that they can't yeah. like prepare for. Like the thing could just blow up and you would be like, Okay, there's all of our reality TV stars that just died on TV right. or obviously wouldn't be live at that point. But um Right. Well, but and yeah, they're doing important work, right? Like yes. they're up there for a reason. I spent, like in the book, they're trying to create to build the Mars rover to like yep. maybe colonize Mars because uh, you know the Earth is in a bad place. It's what their actual job is is super important. You know, on on most reality shows, they just give them a bunch of alcohol and say you can't watch TV and watch, yes. watch the sparks fly. They don't have yeah. to do anything. Uh, but on you know yeah on this they're they're trying to save humanity. And like anything, you put people in a remote area, man and a man and woman. Things are going to happen between people inevitably because they get in the mood to do things. Right. And that's obviously going to have sparks fly and, and things happen like that, too, and relationships build and all that stuff, too. I guess one of the, so this book, a uh, fun story. So I have a, I have a local comic book shop, uh, Galactic Comics and Collectibles here in Maine, um, had this on the shelf. So I, I again, he had Mad Cave was one of those ones that was like. He's such a small shop that sometimes it's hard to, to to stock everything. And Mad Cave is one of those fringe ones where you didn't know much about them yet and so on and so forth. And so I started saying, you need to start grabbing these books and so on and so forth. So uh, when this was released, he took a flyer on it and put it, he sold out immediately. Again, I think Peter's cover, this cover is like yeah. freaking dope, but it was kind of funny. So I was like trying to explain it to a guy named Scott. Uh, who's a regular there, part of our book club that we have every month. And uh, he was like, oh, what's this thing? And, and he first thought it said Kremlin line. So that's why he thought, he was like, okay, this is going to be interesting. And so he picked it up and he got two pages in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he goes, oh my God. <laughs> it's you, you, Two pages in, there's a definitely some stuff that this is not for kids. If anybody no. out there, this is not for kids. Um, What led to going that far into putting that in there? Like it was just... Because so, that's what would happen, or you know, Mad Cave said not to worry about it being PG. Like let's let's make an R-rated book, and so there were only eighty pages. We could only yeah. use so much of that, but it's you know it's part of the storyline that their yes. private moments are being broadcast um, down on Earth, unbeknownst to them. So it made sense to me to open like pretty early on. Let's show you, uh, you know, like the, the the dirty fingernails. Yes, <laughs> and then Peter took what I wrote. And took it in a like very uh, suggestive direction. Like the sex scene that I wrote was a lot more like insinuation, and he just went full bore, uh, jumped right in. Uh, which makes sense if you you know if, if you followed yes. his career. Of course, that's what he did. Um, but yeah, I, I can only take a little bit of credit for that because uh, I, was, I was laughing because I'm like, you you see this happens. I mean, I'm uh, with James Tiny and just just put out uh, World Tree, which is the the, the main character fears and nudist. So you right. see nudity in comic books, you see sex in comic books. It happens. It's, it's one of those beneficial things, I think, to the comic book world, to the to people who don't know, who right. people only see Spider Woman or Spider Man right. as comic books or Batman, like you know, you know, fun colors and all that stuff. That comic books can be a lot more mature and things like that right. to it. But but I was like, I don't know if I've ever seen that in a comic book that I've read recently, where I'm just like, that's just a position that I'm like. It was funny. It was like a, a funny thing. I honestly think you sold more books because of it, because in the, at least in that shop, people were like, oh, that's crazy. I want to pick this book up, see where this is going. And uh, obviously, it's not the whole thing that's in it. There's more to it, but it was just kind of funny. And I liked that it was right off the bat because it wasn't like you got 75% of the way through. It would have felt out of place if yeah. all of a sudden I know where this just happened after all this stuff happened on the on, on the space station. Uh, yeah, and when that's kind of the point of the book too, right? Like it's, it's yeah. what... They're going to show anything that's popular on the internet to get yes. people to pay attention, right, to this thing, um, because 
that's her whole goal. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Diane's goal is to get as many viewers as possible. She becomes obsessed with that, so so she does whatever. Um, but yeah, it reminds me that yeah, your your story reminds me. I, I worked at a comic shop after college, and yeah, I was twenty two, and so I still thought of myself as as young. And you know, uh, we had customers that would come in with thirteen, fourteen years old, and I would be like, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you what comics can be. Like what I you know what I saw in college will be really awesome to you. Not thinking that some things are inappropriate for yes. children. Uh, so I had yeah, I had these these two brothers that um, I now know as adults, but they would come in. One was thirteen, the other was fourteen, I think. And um, they would they were just annoyed the shit out of me. So I would give them things to go read in order to get them to leave me alone. And I thought, oh, you'd love Why the Last Man. Well, the end of the Why trade is like a fully <laughs> nude woman covered in blood. <laughs> and I had forgotten that because I hadn't read it in years. So yeah, I gave them that. And they're giggling. They're in the back giggling and making like a huge ruckus. And I was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> that's how that's how your mom gave you that. Here, try this instead. Yeah. Uh because yeah, you don't you don't think about book as being pr- particularly suggestive, but it, no. is, it is an adult. It's an adult book. Well, it's funny because off air, I actually talked uh, Eliza Clark was on an, uh, a bonus episode we had to talk about the uh, writer's guild strike, and she was the showrunner for the Wild Last Man show. Uh uh-huh. and we were talking off air, things like that, like things that if the show had progressed and actually gone on to multiple seasons, would they've had to show things like that in it? Right. Uh, but obviously for, for, for Hulu, you technically could, but Hulu is owned by Disney. So would they have actually like done stuff like that? But the streaming right. networks allow it. So if, if, if this was popular enough and became a, um, you know, purchase and, and optioned out there uh, and it ended up on like a Netflix or a Hulu or something like the HBO max um, right. or max. Now I should say um, you could show all of this on there. Unlike, yes. If a show was optioned years ago and was just for network television, it would, it would it would it would not work. It'd be no point, I think, in that sense. It, yeah. It's kind of like if if The Walking Dead was about ten years later, again back to The Walking Dead for some reason, uh, it would have been probably on a streaming service, and Negan actually would have said "fuck" like he's supposed right. to with the comic books, and it would have changed some things up. But uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of it's a but like I said, it's taste t- weirdly to say it's tastefully done, meaning that you you do it in a point where it needs to be shown, it needs to be put out there to to kind of get the whole picture of what's going on. But it's not like every page is like just, you know, sex and nudity on it. it it's it's there's a lot of killing if anybody yeah. wants to look at that. But um <laughs> the uh but the whole story, it's a great story. I think it's a, a fun book. And again, it goes down to the whole this is not hard to read people. Like this is uh and I really like your pacing and the way you write. So that makes it even right. easier. Um and, and Mad Cave, I will say buy anything from Mad Cave, but I will definitely recommend uh, Carmen line for sure. Uh, it came out on tr- in trade about the same day your last issue of uh, Hard Ice came out on, yeah. the, on the shelf, which was always fun. Uh, Kyle Starks talked about it. He had where the Mo- where monsters lie. Final issue. I hate this place. Like issue eight and his new Peacemaker series all dropped on the same day. Or <laughs> DC would be a day before, but like yeah, right around the same time. He's like, I didn't plan that. If people are Kyle yeah. Starks fans, it's not going to be good for people. <laughs> yeah, they always. I remember. It's been interesting. Like I've basically been working on three projects for the past two years. Um, and then I have marketing plans for the, the last one because it's comicsology book and comicsology like, is uh exists in name only in a lot of ways yes. now because yes. they, they gutted the company. Um so it's it's been interesting. Yeah, like I like put something out every once in a while. Whereas when yeah. I was at Marvel, I put some you know, three or four issues out every month for a decade. Uh <laughs> But it's it's nice to be able to focus, you know. Like I, when I was working on Carmen Line, it was the only thing I was writing that uh, for those couple months. And um, same thing with the thing I'm doing now. I'm doing a, a crime book about my parents uh, with with Tyler Jenkins, Hillary Jenkins, um, on art. It's amazing. But we've really been able to like build this thing and look at it from a how do I market this non traditional non superhero book to people that might not normally read comics, you know, because like it's a true crime story. So that that's a whole different world. How do I go after that? So it's been it's been interesting to um uh, yeah, to go from four issues a month coming out all the time and trying to figure out the release schedules to like, oh, I can show you guys this in November of next year. Uh in between now yes. and then. I'm gonna be doing other stuff. Speaking of marketing, though, we did mention that both Vault and Mad Cave had great marketing departments. They do a good job getting the book out there in front of people's eyes and things like that too. But Working on independently uh, independent companies and creator owned projects uh, or creator driven projects, there's a lot more marketing on your end to that when you're working at the big two. How has that been a transition? Like trying to like, you went from like basically Spider Woman sells itself in the same that the name Spider Woman is on the front of it, uh, whereas you have to actually sell Dennis Hopeless as a writer. 
yeah it's 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 been an interesting life transition for me because like i during covid i was trapped at home and i was really like I didn't know what it's called, but I was learning content marketing, like learning how to put out stuff that has value outside of just buy my book, right? So like uh, when the Marvel shows first started up, Kyle Strom and I were doing uh, a series where we would talk about those. And then I did a series called Origin Story, where I would interview different creators and have them tell their their breaking in story and different stuff. And then all of that was building toward, okay, Hard Eyes and She's Running on Fumes are going to come out at some point. I got I to gotta market these things. So when Hard Eyes came out, I did a whole bunch of like art trailers and I took podcast interviews that I'd done and edited them down into clips and was like really trying to build um, like social media marketing from that. And then my best friend from childhood owns a marketing company here. And so that led to me doing some freelance work for him and doing content marketing for other people, which has been an amazing uh, like second college in learning Mm -hmm. how to do this stuff for real. And how it works outside of comics. Comics is kind of this weird celebrity driven social media marketing thing where they don't do the stuff that every other company does to get uh, to get sales because mm-hmm. you won't really need to if you're if you're going after direct market. So yeah, especially for this upcoming book, I'm really gonna lean hard into like traditional digital marketing and advertising on true crime podcasts and going after that market and see what I can do. Maybe it fails miserably. Maybe there's a reason all we do is talk to retailers, but um it will be a fun experiment. That's fun. No, it's it's one of those weird things. I've, I've talked to people who've written for for you know licensed properties versus independently owned or creator driven things. It is one of those things you're, you're you go from like selling the characters to selling who's writing it in a sense that. And lucky enough, like I said, if there's someone out there, there's probably Dennis Hopeless fans. I say probably yeah. there is Dennis Hopeless fans that because of all your work at Marvel and at DC over the years and your WWE work and stuff like that people will just pick your book up because, yeah. oh, I like that stuff. I'm probably going to like this, whether they like the genre or not, uh, which is pretty nice. If you're just coming into the world, you get to do a lot more self, you know, sh- yeah. shameless self-promotion in this stuff. But hopefully it's about 10, I would say 10%, but like if there's a percentage of people who would just buy it because it's Dennis Hopeless. Yeah. There's other percentage that needs to buy it because they need to be sold on it, which is, uh, you know, and the biggest one, like you mentioned, is Comixology is different, but like, this one and with uh, Hard Eyes or Carmen Line and Hard Eyes, you're really trying to sell the, the comic book shops. Yes. Uh, and you mentioned retailers because of the fact that they have to then sell it to someone else, uh, yeah. which is interesting. And, so, And that's one of the big things, one of the big suggestions I would make to uh, creators doing creator own books, especially up and coming. Send your first issue in full to all of the retailers, all of the main, because if they read it and like it, they're going to order it for their store. Mm-hmm. If you're just, a, you know, a, and now there's multiple books they have to look at every month and do orders because not everybody's in diamond anymore. It's hard to stand out. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things we did on Hard Eyes uh, was really promote to those um, retailers. But yeah, comicsology is a weird thing because like retailers don't love digital comics because yeah. it cuts into their bottom line. No one is thrilled about comicsology the last couple of years because they've changed the app, right? Like it's it's a uh, tricky, but it's a downloadable product that's relatively inexpensive. Mm-hmm. So if you can sell just the general public on, hey, this is a cool idea you might like. Here's a podcast that I did with the woman. It's based on my mom and I are doing a podcast yeah. talking about the real stories that inspired it. Maybe we can get people to go download that three dollar, four dollar item. Um, but we'll see. I don't know. It may be a, a huge failure, but it'll come out. The book will be in comic shops next year. Dark Horse has put out yes, an edition. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that usually Dark Horse has that uh, that connection with comicsology now. Uh, yeah. We have Mark Bernard in on who wrote uh, the Census for comicsology and, and that's actually just being uh, preview or, or you know, previewed out there right now. Uh, to come out in, in, in trade format as well. So those who people who want to read it in yeah. print form will eventually be able to read it. And I will well. say this, Comixology, everyone I've worked with at Comixology has been great. They were mm-hmm. super supportive at the beginning. The company is just going through changes that have been, have made it difficult and have irritated some of the readership. I, like my experience has been great. They've taken really good care of us. And I hope to make this thing a hit for them despite all of that. Because um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard when it was, it was hard to DC for people too, whenever that went, when all those corporate yep. changes happen, it shakes things up and it makes it harder to to just do your job well. And I don't think the distribution landscape is getting any easier right now with the news that broke this week with, with Image going over to Lunar. Uh, I, I, I talked to my LCS yesterday on it and he was just like, dude, the previews catalog, that, that printed previews catalog they put out is going to be like the size of a friggin' periodical at some point because of how many smaller it's going to go. I posted something on our website about the change that image is going to lunar and da, 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 da. And I actually got an email direct from diamond 
with a quote saying that make sure you put this in the article too, that they're going to still be a wholesaler. They're still going to be that. And I'm just like, Oh, <laughs> getting noticed over there by diamond that, that I'm not giving you the full story on what image is doing here. Uh, right. It's just crazy. That landscape is going to be not any easier for comic book shops. So getting that comic, like you mentioned, getting that issue out to someone or, or something out to someone, even if it's just digitally, uh, a lot of comic book stores, I, my, like I said, my LCS owner, We'll get comics emailed to him digitally, like PDF. Hey, would you mind reading this? If you, if you like it, we would carry the print copy in your store. And right. it's helped him order stuff before too. So, and again, Mad Cave is, like I said, I recommend it. Anybody wants to work with any company and Mad Cave offers you something. It, it, you know, I don't know the details on the structural of contracts and all that stuff, but I tell you what, I've gotten, I have a stack of tubes that come from them that has like, even the John Tiffany thing I mentioned, uh, Dan Panosian's book is, it's a graphic novel, but they sent me a advanced reader's copy, which is like the first, 20 pages 15 pages right. uh, as well with the cigarettes and a poster and stickers and all that stuff and it's like they send those to comic book shops too so hopefully more people will buy the book because of that so that's pretty cool and yeah if i haven't stuff. said yet my experience with Medicaid was great too uh these i have been really selective the last couple of years ago i worked with and colin bunn's a good friend of mine he's worked with Medicaid for years and he spoke really highly of them and it, it was a it was a fantastic experience so um there are good publishers out there doing doing great work and, and doing actual marketing and yeah, like trying new things. Um, it's just, it's a tough, weird comic book landscape these days because everything is, is shaken up. It is. It is absolutely. And Colin Bunn is one of the busiest people in comic books in the world. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, I think every, is. every week there's a new book for Colin Bunn on the market. And, and, and the problem is the, the problem is they're all good too. That's the thing. It's yeah. like one of those things that's like, okay, someone can churn out new comic books every week and have them be like, eh, but someone puts out a new comic book every week and it's actually good. That's that's a that's a talent for sure right there. And Colin Bunn has that. Um uh lastly, I just finish up here is a quick question. Where did Hopeless come from? <laughs> I <laughs> I I the story used to be easier to tell before I got divorced. Yeah. Um I was okay. in my early twenties. Um I was an aspiring comic book writer. My ex-wife was a uh tattoo apprentice she was gonna be a tattooer and we were about to get married and we were trying to figure out do we want is she gonna take my name or you know like what are we gonna do how are we gonna do that and we came up with the idea of just coming up with a yeah. like a rock star name that we can both use uh our families ended up talking us out of legally changing our name um but she was she just became jesse hopeless and i became dennis hopeless the reason it was hopeless is because we had monogrammed towels with an H on them because my real last name starts with an H. And so it felt like it had to be an H word. And uh, sh we were big fans of um, Jim Van Meter's Hopeless Savages. And the characters are Hopeless Savage because they were two punk rock uh, artists got together and had kids. So, and I told Jim that, that I, I don't think I've ever said that publicly before, but I told Jim Van Meter on a panel once, like, hey, you're, we stole your name. <laughs> you're from Hopeless Savages, yeah. That's awesome. It's just funny. It's like one of those things that like, you know, until you do research on someone, you know, you don't know, you don't realize that their actual name isn't what their name is on the thing. My funniest thing is like Rom V and the fact that you see in a Marvel book, it just says the letter V on the, t on the I, front. It always made me laugh a little bit. It was like, is it really that hard just to put the words Rom V oh, on the, like on the, on the, 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 I know it's not how it's everybody's last names on the thing, but it just, to me always looked funny. It was just a V. And I was just like, that's pretty funny on it. But yours all say hopeless <laughs> on it. So, uh, yeah. And when for a minute, like for a long time, people just, they asked me if it was real or not. And then yeah. when I got divorced, I announced that I was going to change to my, to my real name. Yeah. That was a horrible decision for my brand because like when Sea of Stars came out, it says yeah. alum on it. Every, yeah. People were crediting me as the artist because they never heard it in the salon. So at that point, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm hopeless. Hopeless is, <laughs> is, is my brand name. Um, there you go. That's it. it works and, you know, and, and so on. But like, uh, so yeah, I, I, anything else other so comiXology, you got the comiXology book that's coming yes. up at some point, I'm guessing that's going to be like formally announced in the title and all that stuff at some point. Cause I haven't heard it yet. Is that, is that, has, yeah, so it hasn't not, been announced yet? Yeah. ComiXology waits until everything's done. So Tyler's drawing the sixth of six issues now. Okay. Uh, he's almost done. And then the fifth issue, I just got lettering. I should have coloring in two weeks on that. So we're almost, almost okay. to the finish line, but yeah, it should be announced like in the fall. Cool. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to that because I, I don't have a problem. I'll say this this many times on the podcast. I don't mind reading, reading digitally at all. 
I like reading digitally. I lay in bed, my wife goes to bed and I can read out of my iPad and not need some sort of light on in the room or anything like that. Holding a comic book up like this is not the greatest thing. Yeah, I switched, uh, I switched to digital only from when I got my first iPad. Like, yeah. it's so much more convenient to take on vacation or whatever to have 30 books right there. Yeah. And, I, and I'm a, not a hoarder, but I'm a comic book collector in a sense too. So I, I have this, I mean, obviously Mad Cave and Melissa over at Don't Hide, they sent me the PDF to read and all that stuff. Um, but I was like, the second this came out on the shelves, I'm, like, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to put it on my shelf. I probably will. Right. I think I opened it the most for this episode um, and I'll end up just reading it. But I do want the, the physical copy as well uh, because I do like having that, you know, so it's beneficial in some people where they buy it digitally and buy it um, both in paper as well. So, uh, sure. and then, uh, yeah, anything else that you kept coming up other than that? Just the, just the comicsology thing? You going <laughs> yeah, back to right Marvel? Um, I've got, so I've got DC work coming mm -hmm. up but that's not announced yet either and then uh as soon as she's running on fumes is the name of the comicsology that uh that'll be announced soon as soon as that's done because i i'm doing a lot of marketing stuff for that so that's taking a lot of time i have a couple of different projects um on back burners right now that i'll that i'll pull forward with. so cool. um my goal is to do a couple of books a year um doesn't mean a couple of books will be in that, uh, released a year yeah but we'll work yeah, on them yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna do two books a year going forward so Dennis Hopeless isn't going anywhere and he's busy. That's 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 the important part, right? You're making Very money, busy. you're paying the bills. Yes, that's, that's good. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so grab a Carmen line from Mad Cave. It's available at your local comic book shop and where books are sold because it's the graphic novel. And the uh, trade for Hard Eyes at Vault Comics comes out July 19th. So uh, make sure we are, should be, I mean, you should be able to still pre-order that now. Um, yep. So let your LCS know to pre-order that for that too as well uh and, and check out you know follow you on social media and stuff like that too i really appreciate you coming on and chatting with us taking the time out of your day to do this uh and hope the best for you dennis keep up the hard work okay thanks a lot appreciate you thank you everybody for listening to episode number 110 here on the capes and tights podcast with dennis hopeless comic book writer we talked the carmen line grab that at your local comic shop we talked hard eyes july 19th the trade hits shelves from vault comics Follow Dennis on social media. You can just search Dennis Hopeless on all social medias, but also follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And be sure to subscribe, rate, review, all those stuff on uh, uh, Facebook. Yeah, no, on uh, Apple, Spotify, and all your major podcasting platforms. And as always, visit capesandtights.com for a wide variety of features, columns, posts, news, and other podcasts. Thank you to everybody for listening. This has been the Capes and Tights Podcast, and I'm your host, Justin Soderberg. Peace. Thank you